Good afternoon. How is everybody today? Not that you can actually tell me. I'm so glad to see all of you here today um, on our July Native Plants at Noon at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center. My name is Tammy Thompson, and you all know that this is one of my favorite days of the month. And I am so excited to see you here. Next month, we will take Native Plants at Noon on the road again and visit the Missouri Department of Conservation Sand Prairie, south of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. I love a good road trip, even if it's virtual, and I hope you'll join us virtually. That, that prairie is going to be something that most of us have never been able to see before, so I'm really excited for that. And then back in September, we will get a chance to catch back up with Alex and Sydney. Today, Alex and Sydney are going to talk about what's blooming now, and there is just so much. Uh, so during the program, if you have questions, please note those in the Facebook uh, comments or in the Q&A tool on Zoom, and we will get to as many of those as we can. I'll be using the chat feature to send you the plants mentioned and the links uh, that they share during the broadcast. And be sure to stay to the end to have a chance to win a prize. So let's get started. First of all, we want to express a big, big thank you to the Missouri Department of Conservation for their partnership on this series and everything they do to help encourage and empower people to plant more native plants. But we also wanna thank you for your support and the work that you do to actually put in action the knowledge that we share on this broadcast. What you do to actually make native plantings happen is critical to our future and our environment. And we want to say thank you. Thank you for the boots on the ground that you put. With that, I'd like to welcome Native Landscape Specialist Sydney Ross and Alex Daniel at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center. Sydney and Alex, take it away. Hello, everybody. Hi. We hope you're all doing well in this hot, hot summertime we've got going on right now. Uh, this is Alex Daniel. This is Sydney Ross. And we're the Native Landscape Specialists here at the Discovery Center in Kansas City. And we have a ton of things to talk about today from different tools to different plants and some fun activities you can do with nat native plants in your own home when the heat is a little too much. So without further ado, we're going to start by talking about what is in our tool belts, because many of you have uh, commented, Tracy Toomley, uh, yeah. Twombly, can't say your last name, I'm sorry. Um, so we're going to kind of take a glimpse in what is in Alex's tool belt, and uh, maybe this will inspire you to get some new gadgets for your gardening adventures. Yeah, so I use, what this is technically an electrician's belt, and it's got a pouch for my phone, very handy, and then it's got room for my two tools that I always keep with me. So this first one is my Felcos. These are the best pruners out there and absolute must for any gardener. And just got a fresh blade on me, <laughs> so you can see they're a little older. <laughs> yes. They last forever. We don't lose these because I didn't never let anyone borrow these. Never. <laughs> and they're bright red. So that also yeah, helps when, it, when you do drop them in your garden. But they're yeah. very, very sharp. So please, uh, if you do get some new Falcos or any kind of pruning tools, be sure to be careful. Keep yeah. them closed. And uh, keeping them in that tool belt keeps it, you and your tool safe. Yeah, for sure. I dropped one of these open on my leg one time. Not and, very fun. Uh, <laughs> it's not very fun. <laughs> They're very, very sharp, which makes them excellent tools for the garden. And they can take on many widths of things uh, beyond what they say even. So that's um, one tool that I oh, always have. Also, I want to mention with the Felcos, we use the number two slash three blade. Uh, we picked yeah. ours up from Soil Service here in Kansas City just today to get some new ones. Yeah, so these are the number twos. They're the right-handed number yeah. twos. There's a bunch of different shapes and sizes. This is just the best one Yeah, for us. It's got a little spring on there. Yeah, yeah. perfect. And then my second tool that I do lose pretty often, I should paint <laughs> it or something, but this is my five-point paint scraper. And it's got, uh, you can see one point here and it's got a little hook there. 
and then kind of a beveled edge there. And you can even sharpen this to make it even more lethal. <laughs> but um, I love this tool because it is what I use to, I don't know, should I do a demo of like sure. stabbing? <laughs> Stab, take out some of that, uh, what do you got there? Crabgrass? Crab grass. Right here. So I use this to stab underneath the weeds to get the roots out like that. Wow. Yeah. When you told stamp, me about stamp. this tool, stamp, I stamp. was skeptical and then I'm a believer. So I now recommend this to everybody. Um, yeah, it's yeah, a great little tool. It. Yeah, it's great. And I learned this from <laughs> gardeners past the, um, this is, this is the best tool for uh, residential gardening and native gardening. Like, so it's also one of the tools I use is the point, which helps me to get underneath. Um, it can go in little cracks or underneath really delicate little things. So very, very helpful, useful. Tool. Yeah, and you can buy um, most of these tools at your local hardware store. Um, we got the tool belt from- Home Depot, I think. No, no, Sutherland. no, Sutherland's. That's yeah. where we got it. I remember yeah. it was um, really fun. We've yeah. been, we've gone through so many different tool belts, but this one is the best. I even keep pens here. Cause you know, I like to draw things. Sometimes I'll hook my keys on here. Sometimes yeah. I'll keep bugs in here. So that's always that's fun too. Bug. If I find a cool yeah. dead bug, I keep put it in there. Yeah. Old nature treasure. To, the treasure. That's right. You don't have to wear a belt, but I do. Um, and, but you can use it without a belt too, using the flat thing. You just stick just it in your that. pants. Yeah. Perfect. And, um, so we've got, but the, the point, five point scraper, you're going to find that in the painting aisle. Felcos you will only find at nurseries. I don't think they sell these at, um, hardware stores okay I would good go call service for if you're in that's kansas city yeah. or order them online through felco's website that's right yeah that's right yeah all right so now with that we're gonna move on to some plants and as you know it is hot 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 outside um so the very first plant we're gonna talk about today is smooth sumac or rus glabra did i say it right who knows it doesn't matter <laughs> but it's this large thicket forming uh small tree or shrub over here um, and we'll get up a little closer, but um, it is great and full sun. I think it can handle a little bit of part shade or part sun rather. It does need um, at least four to four hours of direct sun. But um, again, this is a great example of right plant in the right place. So since it is so prolific and spreads rhizomatically as well as by the bear or the droops rather, which look like berries, uh, you wanna be mindful of where you plant this plant. It loves to spread out. Um, it does, for me, it kind of has a tropical feeling to it just with all the, the leaves um, and those bright red fruits. Um, but beyond aesthetics, it's also a great plant that supports birds. Um, in fact, before we began the show today, we saw a catbird picking off the droops, which uh, a droop, let me just give a little definition. It is a lot like a berry, but it's not as juicy and it has a little stone pit as the seed. So really the difference between a berry and a droop is whether or not they're juicy and then the seed type of seed inside of the, the fruit. So um, speaking of the fruits, there's some cool things you can do with it. And I have been nerding out lately. If you know me, you know, I'm a total native plant nerd and I'm an artist. Um, so last week I taught a natural ink and dye program here at the Discovery Center. Um, and I made my own inks out of materials like the droops from the sumac, black walnuts, even sycamore bark. So if you are interested in getting obsessed with something new, you might check out this book, Make Ink by Jason Logan. Uh, my new favorite catchphrase is, will it ink? And yes, it will most of the time. I don't recommend making ink out of Japanese beetles though. It smells really bad. <laughs> so um, anyway, I wanna show you some of the inks I made. So here is what the sumac ink looks like. I also did blackberry, saladine poppy, black walnut, Plains Coreopsis and Grapevine Charcoal. I found all these recipes in the book, Make Ink, and uh, Tammy will link that book in the show notes. Um, but then also, before you make your sumac ink, you can make some sumac aid. So I don't know how well you can see this, but this jar is full of the fruit from the sumac. Um, and if you pick a berry off or drip off of the sumac and put it in your mouth, it's really sour. It has malic acid on the exterior of the droops. Um, and if you soak these in water, just in a jar overnight, put it in your fridge, um, you can do it overnight or even for a few hours, you have a tasty sumac aid. It's, it's kind of tart. Some people will add sweetener to it. I like it just straight up. Um, if you were in my class last week, you had some very concentrated version of sumac aid. 
Oh my gosh, my mouth is watering. I know. So <laughs> Just bad. thinking about <laughs> it Just makes about me. It. It's really refreshing. Yeah. Times like this. And don't Can I tell the story about? Please. Yeah, yeah my, my, dad, my dad, my dad, who's elderly, I'll call it right now. Sorry, dad. Hi, Papa. <laughs> Hi, Papa. <laughs> he um, told me that when they were in Boy Scouts, they were taught that if they didn't have any water, if they ran out of water, they, they would suck on sumac berries and it would make them drool, basically, and give them a little make bit of feel. moisture. And I swear, just looking at sumac berries makes my mouth water. It does. I love sour candy. I was definitely I in don't. the era of <laughs> candies yes it, it's um, it's a real it's a real sour lovers <laughs> so very what you can do is make your sumac aid and then when you're done pull the droops out throw them in a crock pot cover them with water and let it simmer for a while and it will release the pigment in the sumac which you can then bind uh combine with a binder like gum arabic and you have your own ink that you can draw with or paint with how cool is that so, so cool you can cool off enjoy some sumac aid and make some art ones. yeah Okay, so we are going to head on, um, maybe get a closer look at the sumac. Oh, you know what? While we're walking, uh, I wanted to mention, I heard that Kelly Daniels is going to be at Planet Native this oh, year yes. doing wild edible yeah. um, native plants. And I'm so excited Me to see too. her. She's awesome. I've never met her before. Own. So yeah. I'm ecstatic. I've heard Kelly Daniels' name floating around. Um, yeah, but, she's awesome. Are you all registered for Planet Native? Yeah, it's get registered. September 12th through the 16th. It's our favorite week of the year. It is. It's like, it's and our it's, favorite holiday. It's really. longer. I, I, was trying, I was trying to try figure out how they could make it better, and they made it they longer this did. year. They did it. Um, and something else that's happening that same week that kind of ties into SUMAC um, is our Monarch Mania program on Saturday, September 17th. And the reason um, I bring that up is because sumac, it could be a great replacement for bush honeysuckle, the non-native invasive plant that we're all battling here in Kansas City and beyond. Yeah. Um, because of how prolific this plant is, if you have a more natural area and you just want it to fill up with some kind of shrub, um, once you remove and treat that honeysuckle, you could consider planting this. And Alex has a pretty cool thing happening at Monarch Mania. Yeah. Want to talk about that a little yeah, bit so we're going to do a honeysuckle trade-in at Monarch Mania. So you just bring a picture of your before and after of your honeysuckle removal, and you'll get a really nice shrub that, mm -hmm. yeah, shrub or tree that we've lovingly grown in our yeah. greenhouse. And um, uh, so this, yeah, this one we're talking about sumac, sumac. We'll have some um, uh, fragrant sumac mm -hmm. there too, which is a shorter version of, uh, it's just another sumac that's shorter, but it can be used the same way. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. All right, so let's move on. We've got a few more plants to talk about. Um, while we're walking, Tammy, if we have any questions, we could probably take one before we get to our next location. We right. actually do. Um, are the natives, Sherry writes or asks, are the natives blooming well now, even though it's dry lately? Oh, great because question. they're yeah. deeper. We, we're going to talk about that. You know what? Even native plants can struggle when we have long, um, long weeks, months of little rainfall and high temperatures. So something we recommend is if in your garden, in, the, in your front yard or somewhere that's really prominent that you're going to look at or people are going to see. Um, if you're concerned about how they look, you might consider watering them in the morning. Um, the heat and the uh, drought is not going to necessarily kill these plants, but they are focusing all their energy in their roots. So they will start to droop. Their flowers may not look as uh, beautiful as they did when they first bloomed. They'll go to seed faster. They'll go to seed faster. They're kind of in panic mode um, and trying to self-preserve um, themselves. So. That's yes. So we we uh, do water our beds that are two years old or younger. Um, so we water Corona Prairie. We water the Primrose Prairie um, and the South Pond. Well, the South Pond didn't get any water this year, but it's holding on. But we also water um, places where, yeah, it's like if stuff's looking really sad and droopy, that is just something we do for aesthetics and to keep our plants around a little bit longer. Um, it's totally a looks thing, though. It's not really going to affect the plants, um, but it is nice to water if you can because that helps wildlife.
we've lost you. There we go. I talked about eyelash wrap instead. You're hey, back. Sammy. Yeah, that's fine. You're back. There, we can see you now, Alex. Hey, Tammy, can you hear me hey. now? We can hear you. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, guess what happened? Exactly what happened last year in our July show. <laughs> uh, Sydney's phone overheated and died. Oh, All right, I'm no. going. Is this good if I'm like this? This is good. Yes, you protect that phone and protect yourselves. <laughs> this is all, don't worry, you guys, we get to play in the greenhouse for the rest of the day today. So don't feel too bad for but, us. You know, that brings up a good point. Um, if you are doing gardening, be safe out there. Please drink Please. so much water. So much water. I keep reapplying sunscreen all the time. Cats. Cats sunglasses. And long sleeves if you want. Long light sleeves. Like but colors. also work in the morning. Or yeah. in the evening when things cool off. It is way too hot and it's not worth endangering yourself um, to be out here in your garden. So we've been, we've definitely been doing that. And thankfully, uh, we have good support from our supervisors to stay safe. So stay safe out there. <laughs> yeah, stay safe. So. Okay, so what are we talking about next? Okay. Sydney? Yeah, we're back I'm, to business. I'm standing here in, Cro or not Corona Prairie, <laughs> <laughs> Primrose Prairie, my baby. Um, <laughs> this is the garden I designed and it's, we installed last year. Um, and so I want to show you a couple grasses because we don't talk about grasses enough. I feel like when folks are thinking native plants, they think of flowers and things like that. So um, I'm going to show you side oats grama, which is a uh, Budalua curdependula. Did I? You got it. That? I can <laughs> see it in my mind. Don't know if I said it right. Um, and I didn't put this on our list, Tammy, but I'm going to talk about eyelash grass because, you know, that's my favorite. It's Budalua gracilis. Um, both are cute little ornamental uh, clump forming grasses that would be great for residential spaces. Um, so here is the first eyelash grass. And uh, as the name, the common name in, uh, describes, the blooms and the seed heads look like false eyelashes. How cute is that? So they love hot, sunny, dry areas. Um, you can commonly find these growing uh, throughout Western Kansas and into Colorado even, um, it, but they prefer drier areas. So um, this eyelash grass, you can see it's got some nice little fine texture to Oops. it. And this is in its second year. So everything in this bed looks a little leggy. As you know, um, once they get established in their third and fourth year, they kind of calm down a little bit and act um, and it, as uh, the way that they're more likely described by native plant vendors. Yeah, this they're getting used to the this the soil's too good in here. You know, it's, it's got a lot of nutrients, it's so they're soil. kind of yeah. it's new soil too. So it's like they're they're just um, getting. It's, it's like they're getting they're on roids this year, <laughs> but next year they'll mellow up. Yeah, and we don't fertilize any of our gardens. The most we do when we establish a new bed is put compost down, and that is it. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the beautiful things about native plants is they require fewer resources. Um, we did mention, again, if, if your plants are looking a little sad and you want them to perk up, you can water them, um, but you really don't have to otherwise. So here is um, the other grass I wanna talk about, side oats grama. And the reason the word grama is in the common name is it, it speaks to graminoids, which is the family that these uh, species are part of. Uh, they're gra um, in that grass family. Um, but I love just how they hang off the side. And um, I was hoping we would catch it when it was still in bloom. It was last week, they were still blooming and they, they had these cute little red um, uh, parts hanging off of it. I'm not a bot. The dangly bits. The dangly bits. I'm <laughs> they not a the dangly bits. But it, even, um, fly, even grasses bloom, y'all. I know, that's like the crazy thing. When I learned that um, a while ago that grasses have little flowers too. 
Um, they're, you know, they're not pollinated by insects or typically wind pollinated, but that just blew my mind. And they're, yeah. take a closer look at some of the, the native grasses and see if you can spot them blooming and um, to see how yeah. they transition. One of my yeah. favorites, just quickly to mention, is Eastern Gamma Grass has an yes. insane bloom. It's, it's huge. And it really like the little, the around. anthers are really long and yes. purple and it, it's wild. It is wild. Plants are wild. Y'all. Plants are so cute. So maybe consider adding grass to your landscape. Always. Like, Grasses um, are important. They are. They provide uh, cover for wildlife. Seed they value. shelter for uh, beetles in the winter. But then also, um, for me, I, when I think about aesthetics in your garden, they they make a nice transition from lawn to garden. So if you're concerned about having a more formal situation in your landscape, that could be a nice way to ease that transition. Um, sedges work well in that way too. Oak sedge is one of my favorites for shadier spots. Yeah. Okay. Where should we? So now, um, Alex turn? is going to take us Hi. to see um, <laughs> um, a few different plants. Yes. And then we'll take more questions here in just a moment. Okay, we're gonna make this very quick because we're running long time and my phone will maybe overheat too. So <laughs> yes, I'll try <laughs> to keep it shaded. In the, in the sun for as little as we can. Okay. Um, so the first one we're going to is the rattlesnake master. Okay. And... Run, 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 run. <laughs> okay. This is one of my favorite. Yes. So wild looking. And if you have uh, the the pleasure of having this plant in your yard you also get visited by so many different pollinators the pollinator diversity on um on rattlesnake master is so high in fact i don't know if you'll be able to see this no you they're so tiny it's there's, the tiniest well there's bees. a stupid japanese beetle of course, out here. of course there's milkweed beetles there's wasps there's solitary bees there's a thread leaf or thread lace wasp over there Gorgeous. anyway i love this plant so much i have to talk about it every year and this plant is also, of course, I lost your bit of string. That's all right. Well, you can make cordage out of the leaves. Um, and you can see they're just very fibrous. So you can dry the leaves and make ropes out of it. So that's another fun uh, activity that we do here at the Discovery Center during different, uh, some of our uh, educational programs. programs. Yeah, yeah. Educational programs. But as you can see, Rattlesnake Master. It's a prairie species. It loves to be out in the hot, hot sun, no shade. Um, yeah, and they planted this as a uh, street in the street on Truce in the yes. 20s, up in the 20s. Um, they have it planted in the hell strips in the media. It's, so it's so happy there. Yes, it's so happy. It loves that extreme heat, yeah. that really hot, hot. I also love um, keeping it intact through the fall and winter because um, it, it has an attractive form to it. Uh, so I know we're not thinking about winter right now. I don't know. Maybe oh, you I are. Want to. I'm thinking it's about it. It's pretty hot out, but um, it's it does create nice winter interest. So, but dang, I don't I don't know that y'all can see these teeny tiny pollinators come, buzzing around. You have to come see it for yourself. It is. It's popping. It's, it's popping. Pop. Okay. Um. Okay. So moving, moving on. Our next. We can see them. Is... You did we see them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our our next plant is the. Do you want? Is this? This is. Yeah, this is right? great. Oh, actually, and look, you can kind of see how they're they're up against Sorry. each other too, because they look really cute together. They do. I don't okay. know if you can kind of capture the two together, but this is a, a prairie blazing star. This is Liatris pycnostachia, and uh, this is one of our. Um, we have a lot of Liatris species in the Kansas City area and uh, in the Midwest, and this is one of the ones that does best here. In Kansas City, and these are two-year-olds, so they're they're doing better standing up straight and and taking their true uh, form and height. Um, they're doing pretty well, and you can see them planted together with the rattlesnake master over there. I really love that combo. Look at I that do white too. And, purple. That's and really look great. at that! Look at all the pollinators. I mean, it is a pollinator buffet, magnet, a buffet over here because these are still blooming. Mm -hmm. We did water this bed last week a little bit because it's only two years old but you know i've noticed even in our more mature beds uh that we haven't watered they look fabulous in this heat like they still are oh, handling yeah. the heat really well so rattlesnake master and liatris yeah two go-tos maybe they're i was gonna say maybe they're the new hot girl summer native plant here in kansas city i think so even this rose verbena is doing really well look at that extreme i know i haven't watered that one it is extremely hot right here yeah and oh, actually yeah. we've had some interesting situations with rose verbena lately if you have any feedback on um if you're seeing your struggle if you're seeing your thrive we'd love to hear your comments in the chat 
but we are going to seek shelter <laughs> before our phone overheats again. Um, yeah, let's get in here. Okay, so we have this crazy, um, <laughs> it is a, um, oh my gosh. It's a, it's a fort, it's a vine fort. You wanna do that one, is that one good? Oh, look how beautiful there that is. is. Does anyone know so, what this is? Yes, I bet some of you have this one. Okay, we'll just tell you, Alex laid on it. That, is this, this is our, one of our native passion flowers. This is Passiflora incarnata. And it is a, just a tropical, I mean, look at it. It's passion flower. It's a passion flower. You can just Man, see it. when I first saw this plant, I screamed and was like, how is this not an alien? Cause look at it, it's just crazy looking. So look how wild. funky it is. So yeah, it is a, th again, right plant, right place. This stuff will, if it's happy, it will take off. So just be aware, um, you'll want to have a trellis for it to climb. It prefers full sun. Um, it and is one of the host plants for the variegated fritillary caterpillar, and it is, I can't find one right now, of course, but typically if you look for just a second, you'll find these really black and orange fuzzy, not fuzzy, spiky caterpillars on it, uh, feeding. And it also, are you looking for fruit? No, I haven't looked for the fruit yet. Another common name for this plant is maypop. Um, and I love the fruit. Actually, I actually like the fruit when it's not fully ripe. Uh, again, I love sour things. So, um, once you, you let it get a little ripe, but then, um, I don't know if Alex, if you found one, so, they, all got eaten. they all got eaten, did they? Well, they're, it's still pretty early for fruit anyway, oh, yeah, one little, tiny one. but what happens when you squeeze it? Okay. Ready? Pop. <laughs> and you can see the seeds inside. Yeah. Here's another uh, uh, fruit you can is for sour lovers. Yeah, I was just telling um, them how I like to eat it when it's still pretty uh, unripe. Yeah, I like to eat it when <laughs> it's a freak. when it's brown and all juicy on the inside. But it's still okay, dry. we're gonna come into the shelter here. Yeah, to <laughs> we've always wanted to do this, and now we actually get to. <laughs> we're in this tiny little I fort structure. It. It's so small, we barely fit in here. <laughs> but uh, we hope Shady. you've enjoyed uh, the different plants we've talked about. But we'd love to answer some of your questions if time allows can't see what time it is <laughs> yeah uh, you guys did great you, you answered a few questions as we went along so that's all perfect right. all right so we'll just we'll just go right into them and for those of you if we don't get to your question i have we, we have screenshotted them so we will try to perfect. email you an answer to your question so tabitha asks how often do you clean your felcos and with what <laughs> tabitha oh, why would you ask us tabitha. this question well, you should really, okay, what in you, theory, you should clean your Falcos um, way more than we do. We don't, <laughs> we're really bad. Yeah, I feel embarrassed. But the most I do, so should we just switch blades? So when the blade wears out, you get a new one, or you can sharpen it if you're one of those people who can sharpen things. <laughs> That's not me. But um, you can get a new blade, and when you take it apart, I like to clean it, like wipe it down with a rag and put, um, uh, what do we, what is it called? PB blaster. Uh, like it's like an oil. It's, it's kind of like, M uh, it's kind of like, um, WD40. WD I almost said MDF. Yeah. That's but it's more like, metal. it's, it's specific for tools. Like, I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. Add some of that and then just wipe them down. And I always scrape, I actually, this is what I use my paint scraper for also is when you get into something really gunky. Cause I used to, cut um grapevines and they're really sticky and it would all stick together for a lot so you can use this to sort of i don't know if you can see that scrape off the stuff from yeah. there pretend there was stuff on that and you scratch awesome. my blade <laughs> yeah <laughs> I scratched it. Sorry. That's, good. that's awesome and um okay so nancy asks i thought sumac was poisonous so great, great okay question. so and she says she knows there are varieties that are so let's get to that one yeah do you want do you yes want go for it okay take it so away. we in missouri we only have a uh, poison sumac in maybe two counties i think in the south so you're not going to run into it um not like here yeah. not likely but yeah so you want to make sure that you're that you're correctly iding everything mm -hmm. like we don't listen to us obviously <laughs> always do your research before yes. you eat anything we're guys and we're not experts yeah that, we are so and and like we've said common names are very very especially dangerous when it comes to wild edibles yeah make sure you've got the latin name you're fully iding the whole plant 
and you're fully, fully confident that what you have is right. So that you don't want to eat the poison sumac. There are other sumacs, not in this part of the world, that are green that you don't want to eat. I guess the berries. But, but the staghorn sumac, which is a non-native, or at least yep. it's not native here, um, you can you can make sumac aid out of those berries mm -hmm. too. Those are fine. And that one looks just like smooth sumac, but it's fuzzier shorter and too. shorter. Yeah. A little bit and shorter. it's typically you see uh, staghorn sumac on the roadsides. Yeah. Um, you you'll you might see smooth sumac but i typically see more staghorn than that so but that's a great question always do your research a good question always. and like my favorite forager black forager alexis nicole says happy snacking don't die so do your <laughs> <Don't> research <die. laughs> yeah. that's really good advice yeah and really succinct so everyone can understand that yeah. um so diane asked kind of a, a similar question um is the sumac plant an, a skin irritant Hmm. Oh, that's a great question. You know, I did hear our friend Megan, our coworker, um, ha has a reaction to cutting fragrant sumac. Mm -hmm. So I, I personally don't. You do? That's interesting. I do. Yeah. yeah. But I have it to lots of things too. So I didn't know if it was, I have grasses, yeah, I, all kinds of things. I do that to me. I personally don't either. I react to um, Virginia creeper mm -hmm. really bad mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of people don't. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, you want to make sure that you are not um, allergic to it first. And we always say when you're trying a wild edible, obviously this is with any wild edible, just eat a little bit at just first because if you are allergic, you don't want to find out after you've eaten a whole can. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's smart. <laughs> Stacia <laughs> asks, this is a really good one. Stacia asks, when native lands adapt to survive a drought, like fewer blooms going to seed, what does that do to our native pollinators, butterflies and birds? Well, it has a negative impact. Yeah. You know, okay. um, if there's no, yeah, if the plants are dried up, they don't have the amount of nectar that they normally would. They don't have the pollen that they normally would. Um, and so there are just fewer resources yeah. that way. And there are already too few of resources. And as, there. yeah, and as climate change progresses, this is something we're going to see more and more of. Um, but again, they, not to be all doom and gloom about it, but plant native as much as you can because they can't our, our native plants have adapted to our climate which has already been pretty I think extreme just you know we have intense mm -hmm. uh, ice and winters and um, hot summers yeah <clears throat> so they're adapted to that but um, we're not no, no one is adapted to the intensity of the climate right now so yeah, yeah. And so that's why that's what another reason that it's so important to like think about our non-native invasive species too because as we lose species that can't hold on perhaps the non-native invasives are going to come in too um so if we i don't know well and <laughs> we weren't gonna yeah. go sad on that's, this one but i will say the reason why the non-native invasives yeah, um, can that. handle it better that. is because they don't have biological predators to keep them in check yeah um they so have an they have an advantage they're they're affected by this heat and drought too but they don't they're not getting eaten and relied on it oh there's a cute bee oh uh, there's two cute bees <laughs> yes, folks, oh shiny uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway yeah that's a great question and it uh, it does affect everyone everything mm -hmm. yeah yeah but it so far absolutely we've not does. lost any of our not fully lost any of our native plants that we've mm -mm. had here but we're very of the mind that if you don't if you can't survive here then you that then that's this is just not the right place so there's a lot of native missouri plants that we have that happen to be able to survive here but there's tons that we will never be able to keep alive here because of how extreme even just in the state of Missouri um how extremely different some of the ecosystems can be like that sand prairie that you were talking oh, about yeah so excited about species. that yeah I'm so excited about that you're gonna see species in that that we can't ever have here because yes <laughs> that's way too yeah <laughs> Sure. Well, I am going to cl start closing this out. Um, I we have documented yeah. all of the rest of I'm the questions, and you all had some great, great oh, questions. No. <laughs> um, Tammy, you're lose? Tammy, you're froze. Oh, I'm frozen yes, now. Yes, we love Casey Parks planting more native plants. We are so excited about that. We are we are very very down. Big sands. I don't know if you can hear. We can hear you. Am I frozen? Can I have my producer co-hosts let me know if I'm frozen to you? Okay. 
I don't think I am frozen. I th okay, okay. We lost you, actually. You're good now. I couldn't see you. Okay, cool. So I'm going to close oh, out. Well, I stopped. I was just going to say thank you all so much yeah, for joining us yeah. today. Come visit us at the Discovery Center. Not on this week. Not this week. Come Not back next week. week. Yeah. Or if you do early in the morning or in the evening to walk the grounds um, and sign up for Planet Native. We'll be there. We will be yes, you will. We, we are so excited for you guys to be there. So yes. we're going to go. You guys can stay on screen if you want. As I know everyone loves to see you. Uh, so go ahead and stay on screen. Um, we want to give a war a prize right now. So we're going to give an, a, a prize to an astute viewer. The winner of this prize will receive a set of native plant note cards, each featuring a unique native plant drawing by local Kansas City artist Nancy Waugh. And for those of you not lucky enough to win today, they are available for purchase on our website. So the quiz question is, what are the dates of the Planet Native Conference? Jahida, would you choose all of the right answers from the chat and put them in your little chat wheel and give me the, give me the winner at the end? So with that, we want to say thank you to these two. They are just the pride and joy of Native Plants of no at Noon, and we just love working with you guys. Um, head out to the Discovery Center, not today, um, and see all of the amazing sites. Uh, take care of yourself today and head out on a morning or on a better day. It is teeming with colors and textures and sounds, and I was just there Friday seeing you guys, and it was buzzing with activity. So it is so fun. Uh, to learn more about what's going on at the Discovery Center, you can go to mdc.mo.gov and search for events at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center. Uh, Deep Roots is always needing volunteers to help with projects in our demonstration garden at the Discovery Center as well. So go to the Get Involved tab on, Deep, on the Deep Roots website and let us know if you want to be a volunteer. We would love to see you out there. And as we close out, we want to mention the Planet Native Conference. It is September 12th through the 16th. It is a mix of in-person and virtual conference. We're kicking off Monday, September 12th with an in-person exhibit hall celebration. We're gonna have beverages and food and exhibitors and everyone wants to join in. So it's so exciting. Uh, the following day on Tuesday, we'll have five different, uh, different um, field trips and it, one in St. Louis, Four in the Kansas City area. So we're really excited about that. And on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, our virtual conference with some of the best speakers uh, I've ever met. Uh, not all of them because we couldn't fit all of them into one conference, but we have some really exciting speakers. So we're really excited about that. On August 4th, we have Out on the Prairie with Larry, Larry Rizzo. I know you two know him, uh, Larry Rizzo is uh, works for Habitat uh, Architects and he is going to uh, show us a restored prairie and his take on it. It's really exciting and we've been out there and it's beautiful. And August 18th, we're Nat Native Plants at Noon on the road at the Sand Prairie Conservation Area. So our winner is, I'm going to announce the winner. All right, here we go. The winner is, I'm going to spell it, Arianthe, A-R-I-A-N-T-H-E-E. -E. That you are the winner of the note cards. Ariane, would you send me an email at Tammy at deeprootskc.org and give me an address where we can mail those to you. So if you have missed any of our episodes, you can find them all at deeproots.org. We record and post each one. And so while you're on our site, we would be grateful if you would consider making a donation to Deep Roots as well to continue our work. So have a wonderful day and we will see you all back here uh, for our next Native Plants at Noon. Thank you. Bye guys, thank you.